Welcome to the Sober Life Podcast. I'm your host, Eli Thomas, and I am so happy that you decided to join us today while we discuss all things related to living the sober life, free from the grips of drugs and alcohol and all the chaos that comes along with that. Now, keep in mind, we do aim to be the most interactive show on the internet, so we ask that you send in your questions, concerns, show ideas, or even your own personal story. And you never know, we might even ask you to be a guest on the show. But if nothing else, we will be sure to get those questions answered right here on this forum. Now, without any further ado, let's get into today's topic. Welcome back to the Sober Life Podcast. We have a very special guest with us here today, Mr. Paul Summers, Jr. And I tell you, Paul is a published author. He's got a new book coming out, I believe it's next month in January. And, uh, you know, it sounds amazing. The title is going to be Hide and Seek, A Dad's Journey from Soulless Addiction to Soul Custody. So really wanted to hear a little bit about that. And uh, with no further ado, Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Eli. How are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell you what, I'm kind of intrigued about uh, about your new publishing coming out next month. Tell me about it. Yeah, I am a recovering addict. I have uh, my clean date is six twenty six oh seven, and that was the day where the story basically begins. Probably the worst slash best day of my life. Uh, I was an unemployable junkie. My daughter's mom, my wife at the time, we were both using parents. Uh, our daughter was three and a half. Both of us spiraling. Probably really lucky that we didn't have our child taken away. And I went to her and said, you know, we got to stop. We, we got to stop using. My addiction comes from probably a decade before that. I had substituted drugs. I had quit drinking for about 10 years, but then started using everything else. I moved a thousand miles away from Las Vegas, Nevada to Portland, Oregon, thinking, well, if I just have new surroundings, I'll get clean. And uh, that changed. Within three weeks, I found the dealer in the neighborhood and kept running and gunning. I, Like I said, I tried substituting drugs. I tried uh, some self-help books. I did an outpatient stint where I ended up in a 12-step program. And within 30 days of that, I ended up back out. I was suicidal. And I kept thinking I could I could do this on my own. It's not as bad as I, as I think it is. And but I knew I didn't want my daughter to be well without me. Really, I think. And and my my wife, the woman I married, was much younger than me. And I just thought, you know, she's young and strong. She can take this on. And I really was. I think I was willing to forfeit life and forfeit my connection, my strong bond I had with my daughter. I you know you entertain these thoughts until situations actually arise. And so what happened was I had gone to my then wife and said, we got to try to, we got to try to sober up. We got to try to get clean. We were uh, doing constant combinations of opioids, meth, and alcohol and pot. So it was an, an endless daily journey of keeping the monkey off our back, basically. And I don't think she liked that so much. So the next day when I came home from my temp job that I was barely able to keep, she was gone and the apartment was empty. And uh, so she had, uh, for lack of a better term, kidnapped our daughter and disappeared. And uh, when I got home from work, the, my phone rang and I, I said, you better be on your way home. And she said, yeah, you don't talk to me like that. You don't treat me like this. You'll never see your fucking daughter again and hung up. And I had no idea where they were. And two days later, I got hit with a restraining order, which I was never physically. Vi- I was I was an asshole. I was uh, not a, not and I, I didn't love my, you know, I hated myself so much. Uh, I was not good to be around and I wasn't good towards anybody in any of my relationships, but uh, I was not violent. I was not physically violent with her. And so that getting hit with a restraining order was like, okay, wow. Was this the bottom I've been hearing about? <laughs> it seems like it. So yeah, I just, I did everything to change that pretty much what probably everybody thought who knew me was going to be the obvious narrative was that I was going to lose custody and probably take my own life at some point, either by overdose or, you know, some other way. So I went back to the rooms. I started a relationship with a, you know, a a God of my understanding or a higher power of my understanding, whatever, whatever works for anybody. And that was the beginning of the change. So the book itself, the title is Hide and Seek, 
a dad's journey from soulless addiction to soul custody is that first year, that first year after that event happened. So leading up to my one year sobriety, clean day, birthday, and the tragedy really for my daughter of fighting state and family to say, look, here, I've made these changes. Her mom hasn't. At some point, something bad's going to happen to our daughter. You know, please intervene. And nobody did until something bad did. So it's, uh, you know, not a an all, you know, rainbow unicorn, <laughs> rainbow unicorn story. It's, a, you know, the story of, uh, you know, my one year changing my life and be being the dad that my daughter deserved and, you know, becoming a good human. Wow. That's amazing. It sounds like you were pretty much self-motivated, didn't get an ultimatum or anything like that. You, you just basically kicked yourself in the butt and said, hey, I got to do something. Yeah, just, that's a just good, curious, you know, Paul. How old was your daughter at the putting time? It. She was three and a half, so it was right before her fourth birthday, and so now she is twenty. And nice. her mom never made it out of the. She never put together any clean time, you know, substantial enough to be a significant parent. So she missed out on that. You know, I don't harbor any ill will towards her. I mean, she gave me the gift of of get my shit together, basically. You know, and uh, I've since remarried. And have two stepkids, and their dad is also, I would say, an addict or alcoholic, just his behaviors. He's so, and all three kids have type 1 diabetes. That's how I met my wife. So, different story, different, <laughs> different whole thing. Sure. But, uh, yeah, so we have a lot in common, you know, uh, two sort of abandoning parents on each side, uh, the kids all sharing, uh, you know, the disease of diabetes. And, uh, yeah, it's like living life one day at a time. Trying to turn lemons into lemonade, man. I tell you, that's uh, that's a great story, Paul. And uh, yeah, I tell you one thing. I, I caught in there. You talk about finding that uh, that higher power to the best yeah. of your understanding, and that's one thing I really harp on people about. It's just you can't do this by yourself. You've got to yeah, have faith in something. You know, believe that there's yeah. something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And you know, I tell you, a lot of people just don't get it. You know, I'm tough. I'm strong. I can done everything else by myself. I can do this. And uh, it, it's just not that easy. Yeah. And I think for clarity's sake, you know, especially for your listeners, it, it's not a question of whether you're that strong or tough. It's really the strength comes in surrendering. You know, I will gladly admit, like, I was broken. I was broken. I think if I was under the, the terms of, uh, you know, you got to get it together, man. Like, I have that re that rebel, you know, instinct, I suppose. It's basically like, no, you don't tell me what to do. I'm strong, you know, and that was the lie. That was the, the deception in my head was, you know, you're, I'm stronger than that. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. I can get this on my own. And the answer repeatedly that I refused to see was, no, I, no, I can't, you know. Yeah, and it's, it almost takes a stronger person to admit that. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, again, Paul, that's a, that's a very triumphant story. I love it. You know, and I'm just looking over your shoulder there. I see your, all your, your guitars back there. I actually listened to, um, to a couple of your works. Are you still in the, uh, the music business? Well, you know, is there a music business? That's, okay, different topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, so from when... It took about a year to get soul custody. So my first year clean. And, you know, I'll be totally honest, Eli, it's, music was a good reason for me to be on my worst behavior. You know, I was in punk bands. I was in rock bands. I was in, you know, like uh, psychedelic jammy bands. I toured the country selling CDs when I got a little older and I, you know, kind of went the singer songwriter Americana route. And, you know, it was always mostly playing bars mostly, you know, hooking up with people that wanted to indulge me in my worst behaviors and me gladly accepting, you know, heck yeah, sure. I'll do some of this. I'll take some of that. Oh, she looks good. This looks like fun. Let's do this. You know, oh, I got to live up to the, uh, you know, the rock dude or whatever. So it was like the gift of, you know, I mean, I, I firmly believe, you know, my higher power, I'll call God for the rest of this. So, you know, I made it my clarity statement that like, that's what works for me and whatever works for you is, is a hundred percent. You is that you do you. That's the saying I wanted to say, uh, is that, you know, I believe this was a gift. It was a gift, you know, ma making music, being creative, writing a book. is a way different, uh, different thing to do for sure. But I wrote songs for years. And so being sort of po poetic and in the word, that's a natural part of, you know, I, 
what what I see now as a gift, but I came to see it as a curse. I saw it as a curse of music being something that just brought me into those dark places and enabled or enriched my worst decisions or bad decisions or even unhealthy decisions. So when I got clean and sober, I set it aside, you know, I also because I became fully focused on raising a daughter by myself. And as, as a guy, I'd say that's a little bit harder to do just because a lot of the, the camaraderie women have, the programs in place for them, the fellowships, the you know, they they have a lot more resources, I believe, than males do or that males even seek to have, you know. So it mm -hmm. became obviously because I was working full time and a parent solo parent full time, it was it was pretty much set on the back burner. Every now and then I'd get like a reunion show to do with some of my old friends and and bands, but I also had moved up to the uh, the Portland area from Vegas, so a lot of that meant traveling. I did manage to have a band for a little while that we played some of the NA conferences, which was like the absolute blessing, you know, to be able to play music for my peers in recovery and share that. That was really great. Um, but that only happened a couple of times. And yeah, so there were a lot of years there of not playing music. And then the teen years hit with the kids. And I don't know if you have kids. Do you have kids? Do you like Absolutely. Kids? I've got a 19 year old boy. Okay. So you... You understand those teen years that like 13 through 17 right in there. I've had a lot of people hate me, but not as much as my kid. You know, and you know that just like, <laughs> it's not you. It's not personal. It's, it's just like, wow, I've never been like so despised. And like, I am not listening to this guy. And it's like, dude, I'm sharing my life knowledge with you. And anyway, the kids, you know, that was hard. That was hard. Uh, that's a hard time for any parent. And if you got, uh, you know, teenagers coming into it, man, try to limit that social media time because, uh, you know, there are a lot of forces out there that are trying to knock you down as a parent. But anyway, yeah, those so those years, I kind of got back into like practicing more again, falling in love with my instrument, the guitar more. But it wasn't until after my daughter was 18, 19. So this is just in the last year or so. I was like, well, you know, this is my, you know, it's always been, it's never going to leave my blood. You know, I just find myself with the guitar in my hand and I started, I started creating music. And at this point in my life, I, you know, I've written the book. It's about to be published next month. The purpose of it came through daily prayer for months and months and months. I just, all I did was I prayed for knowledge of God's will, the willingness to listen and to hear God's will. And then the courage and the power and the strength to carry out God's will every day. This is my daily prayer. I don't, I no longer pray for specific things. I just want to know what to do. What am I doing? How would I, how am I going to help somebody else have the same story that I'm privileged to share with you, you know, and your audience? What can I do? And, you know, the answer came up, write a book, you know, tell the story. But, you know, the next thing now that this is about to all be real and available is music. How can I help other addicts and alcoholics and people struggling through music? How can I heal? So I started doing a lot of research. Sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but <laughs> hey, no problem. Uh, it's uh, it's an amazing answer. So we'll take it. Oh, thanks, you. Yeah, I thank you. So I started doing research on you know, well, what can I do? How can I how can I do something with this? And I found in just in the past twenty years, the research on healing frequencies and how. You know, they're finding that certain frequencies can help different ailments. And they're finally discovering that people who are, you know, in withdrawals and going through all that anxiety and the stress, you know, the missing endorphin rushes and, you know, just the, the negative thoughts, the well-worn neural pathways, all that stuff can be affected by certain frequencies. They're finding, you know, positive ways to positively affect those those parts of the brain that can be affected by sound. And so I started learning about, well, you know, you can tune a guitar a certain way and which is uh, four, 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 four hertz. North, most guitars are tuned to 420 hertz, but it's 444. Four, four, and tuners have that. Most tuners have that ability for you to do that and then play things in the key of C. It becomes this frequency of 528 hertz. So I got a, a sound healing certificate. Like, so I got certified and I've been writing all this music in this frequency range. The idea was actually inspired by a friend who, she opened a rehab center and 
she said, I, I would really in Nashville. And she was like, I really want you to come out here. And because, you know, you're this really talented musician and it's Nashville, it's going to be a lot of musicians in recovery. And, and can you like, you know, create a program for me where it would be helpful to them? And so that's what I, that was the reason I started working on this. Um, unfortunately for her, I guess there's a lot of competition in Nashville for recovery centers, which is a good thing for addicts. She hasn't been able to make that work, but it, anyway, it started this idea, and so I have this different persona. It's not Paul Summers. I call myself Pablo Veranos, which is Paul Summers in Spanish, and mm -hmm. so I'm I'm doing these. I have there's a bunch of songs on on a music platform on all the music platforms. So far, I only have a few of them out, but I started by doing some free gigs at like yoga studios and, and it's just going from there. I don't know where it's going to go. It's this beautiful, organic opportunity to share the gift of my musical knowledge and my ability to play and, you know, all the years that I put into that, just share that in the hopes of, you know, easing the tension for addicts, helping them. It's the kind of music I listen to late at night to relax. So giving back, man, it's all about giving back. Can't keep what we have without giving it away. I love that saying. Well, and I tell you, um, thank you for giving me a little insight in that because I've, uh, I've been doing some speaking engagements at some rehab facilities and, um, uh, I noticed a couple okay. of them had a sound healer come in and I wasn't familiar, Yeah, but it seems like it's becoming a thing. Yeah, it, so it it's, is. Uh, it's growing. Not, no, I definitely appreciate the explanation on that because I, I just wasn't familiar with, I mean, gosh, even pitch, you know, that's, that, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, well, a friend Paul, he we, just posted uh, on. We are uh, just about out of time here, but if you don't mind, I'll oh, okay. uh, I'll put your website out there, and uh, if 